Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show where we cover all news relating to SpaceX's Starship development, rocket launches that we saw last week and can expect to see this week, and discuss other exciting developments in the world of spaceflight. This week, we have some news regarding a rocket that rhymes with glue pen. Hmm, exciting stuff. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel using the link below and ring the bell as well, as this will ensure that you get notified of these news videos when they're new, so that the news is new and not just new to you and not new to the few who, I, I don't know, I'm not very good at freestyle rapping. Uh, subbing ensures that you get these videos when they're out, so that the news is, like, relevant and up to date. That's what I meant. Anyway, apologies. I've waffled on far too long for this week's intro. Let's just roll transition to our first segment, all the launches and spaceflight events that took place last week. The first launch of the week took place at the Huiquan Satellite Launch Center in China on February the 24th. This was a Long March 4C rocket carrying three Chinese Yeogen 3103 reconnaissance satellites which were successfully placed into low Earth orbit. Also on the 24th of February, we had a suborbital test launch of an American Minuteman 3 missile. The missile launched from the Vandenberg Air Force Base and don't worry, these sorts of tests are fairly common and aren't signs of conflicts arising. There was another unexpected suborbital launch as well. This was another missile, a Burkan 2, which was launched from Yemen. This wasn't a test missile though, it was a live warhead. It was aimed at King Khaled International Airport, which is 850 kilometers from the Yemeni border. Saudi missile defenses intercepted the missile in flight, successfully destroying it, but some fragments reportedly fell inside the airport area. Now, talking about war and politics is a bit beyond the scope of this show, and frankly, this news story isn't really something I want to discuss any further. But a spaceflight is a spaceflight, so I felt it worthy of inclusion. Back to orbital launches, on Sunday the 28th of February, we had two of them. The first was in India, and I can't show you the footage because the Indian government copyright strikes YouTube channels that talk positively about their space agency, I guess, so here's a cute cat instead. The launch was conducted by the Workhorse PSLVDL rocket, and the payload included 12 communication satellites for American firm Swarm Technologies and five Indian satellites, one for education, one for reconnaissance and three for technology demonstration. Also aboard was a Mexican technology demonstration satellite and finally there was Brazil's very first Earth observation satellite named the Amazonia 1. All satellites are now operational in low Earth orbit. The next rocket launch on Sunday was a Soyuz 2.1B, which was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome by Roscosmos. On board was a Russian Arctica M meteorology satellite, which was deployed successfully into a Molnia orbit. For those that missed last week's episode, and by the way, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a week, a Molnia orbit is a satellite orbit designed to provide communications and remote sensing coverage over high latitudes and is highly elliptical in nature with an inclination of 63.4 degrees, an augment of perigee of 270 degrees and an orbital period, i.e. orbital duration, of approximately half a sidereal day. The name Molnia is derived from the Molnia satellites, a series of Soviet civilian and military communication satellites that have used this type of orbit since the mid-1960s. Here's to the success of this latest Soyuz outing. Now, all those rockets that we've just talked about, as you know, are operational, but what about the rockets of the future? Specifically, SpaceX's Starship and Blue Origin's New Glenn, both of which will make the current rockets out there look like mere toys, I'm sure. Let's begin with Starship. The prototype all the kids are talking about at the moment is Starship Serial Number 10, or SNX if you want to be really cool, which is sitting on the launch pad in preparation for its destiny of becoming the third full-scale Starship to attempt high-altitude flight. Hopefully it'll achieve this with the grace of the SN8 and SN9, but this time with a slightly less explosive finale. Elon Musk stated on Twitter that he believes the odds of successful landing are around 60%, which is actually really good, considering he doubted the SN8 would get very far at all after takeoff, if takeoff was even achieved, and he gave the what we now know to be the hugely successful debut of the Falcon Heavy a 50-50 shot. So overall, 60% probability for complete success of SN10 is a very promising prediction. 
Time will tell, I suppose. So far, the prototype has been undergoing thorough pre-flight testing. Last week, a static fire test was conducted that seemed to go over well, but then Elon Musk revealed on Twitter that the test showed that one of the rocket's three Raptor engines would need to be swapped out prior to any flight. With the new engine installed, another static fire test was performed, and no reports of further engine swapouts being required have been published yet, so my hopes are high that we'll see the SN fly at some point this week. The SN9 crashed because one of its Raptor engines failed upon reignition, so this time SpaceX planned to relight all three engines, rather than just two, so that if one fails, the vehicle will still be able to touch down. With regard to the other Starship and Super Heavy prototypes, Brendan Lewis's diagram paints a great picture once again of where we are. The first Super Heavy prototype, i.e. the Starship first stage, is still undergoing stacking, and the SN11 and 15 are progressing very nicely, the SN15 being of particular noteworthiness, since it's purportedly the first major leap forward in terms of upgrades and changes since the SN8. It's also why there's a bit of a gap where the SN12, 13 and 14 would be. The SN8 outperformed expectations so well, and provided so much more data than SpaceX thought, that it was decided that the SN12, SN13 and 14 wouldn't be needed, and instead all work beyond SN11 prototypes could be refocused on the SN15. Quite what the changes the SN15 has in store isn't entirely certain, but it's definitely the one to watch out for. Perhaps it'll be the first orbital test of the vehicle, provided of course that the super heavy prototypes will be ready in time. It's hard to say at this stage, but all very exciting nonetheless. Note the little SN7.2 on the left of Brendan's diagram. This is a test tank designed to stress test a thinner stainless steel, 3mm as opposed to 4mm, which of course would lead to a massive weight saving across an entire Starship vehicle, a simulation of which is currently on screen thanks to the fantastic skills of Eric and Smallstar, links to their pages in the description of course. The SN7.2 underwent its first cryogenic proof test on the 26th of January without any issues, however a second test on the 4th of February caused the tank to develop a leak. Now, it remains unclear if SpaceX plans to do any further testing, or if they are satisfied or dissatisfied with the new thinner material. It'll stay on these overview pages for now, but as it's been almost a month since any activity regarding this prototype has taken place, the pessimist in me feels that SpaceX is probably done with this prototype now. Now, that's all I have to say about Starship this week, but of course, for the first time ever, we finally got some news regarding the very secretive Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket. Blue Origin have actually shown us glimpses inside their massive rocket factory in Cape Canaveral, and we finally got to see the new Glenn for the first time. Whether or not this reveal was spurred by the recent photographs posted online, after photographers caught glimpses of a rocket inside the factory after Blue Origin left the doors open, is not clear. But really, it doesn't matter. All I care about is that we now know that the new Glenn is real, and there's actually stuff being made. For those unfamiliar with the new Glenn, it was first revealed in 2016 and is a heavy lift launch vehicle with a recoverable first stage, similar to Blue Origin's suborbital New Shepard rocket, and of course very comparable to SpaceX's Falcon 9. However, the Falcon 9, a medium lift launch vehicle, can only carry 22.8 metric tons to low Earth orbit. The heavy lift New Glenn, on the other hand, will be capable of more than double this, with a 45 metric ton to low Earth orbit capacity, putting it very close to the Falcon Heavy's 64 ton capacity, despite the New Glenn only being a single core. Now, obviously, the biggest difference here is that the Falcon 9 and Heavy have already proven their flight worthiness, while New Glenn remains under construction. But Blue Origin have already demonstrated their ability to build space hardware with the new Shepard rocket, and United Launch Alliance's latest flagship vehicle, the Vulcan Centaur, will be powered by Blue Origin's BE-4 engines. So I'm optimistic that New Glenn will be a success, and I can't wait to see its premiere flight next year. Outside of rocket launches and developments, in fact, outside of this planet in general, we had some more footage of the Perseverance landing revealed by NASA. Absolutely incredible footage here. We got an amazing view of the Martian surface as the rover and Sky Crane performed their absolutely bonkers task of deploying the rover down to the surface. You can see the moment where the Sky Crane hovered above the surface as the rover touched down before flying away to clear itself of the rover. 
As viewers of Space This Week will know, it's not just a rover being lowered here. There's also the Ingenuity helicopter, which will test the feasibility of powered flight on Mars. I'd hoped we'd get to see Ingenuity fly last week as well, however NASA don't plan to deploy it for another two months at the very least. So we'll continue holding our collective breaths for this one. I'm sure this isn't the last time I'll be talking about Perseverance or Ingenuity on Space This Week, so for now I'm going to cut the coverage of the two robots there. If you're enjoying this video so far, maybe you've learned a thing or two along the way, please leave a like down below to help us persevere in the tides of YouTube's algorithm. Sorry, that was awful. I probably should have used more Ingenuity when coming up with... You, you know what, let's just roll the transition to this week's news. <laughs> This week, the first launch may have already happened. That's because it's a Falcon 9 carrying SpaceX's latest Starlink payload, set to launch five hours before I plan to publish this video. Regular viewers of this show will be familiar with the Starlink formula by now, but as this is the only confirmed launch this week, I'll be darned if I'm not going to milk it for all it's worth. This will be SpaceX's 20th Starlink mission, and it'll be flying aboard a Falcon 9 Booster 1049-8, and this will be the first stage's eighth flight overall. This is only the second time a Falcon 9 first stage has been reflown eight times before, but I'm confident that the old girl will have it in her to stick the landing once again on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, which is situated 633 kilometers downrange of the launch site. SpaceX won't be attempting a fairing catch using Ms. Tree or Ms. Chief. Instead, the support ship Navigator and Searcher are expected to recover the fairings from the water. Once the fairings deploy, the 60 Starlink satellites will be jettisoned once the upper stage reaches the deployment area. Now, both fairing halves have flown before, the active half has supported three flights previously, and the passive half has supported two. What's of particular note about the fairings for this flight, though, is that it'll be the fastest turnaround of a fairing, from recovery to reflight, at just 96 days, beating SpaceX's previous record of 127. Interestingly, the Falcon 9 first stage has also undergone a 96-day turnaround since its last flight, which was another Starlink mission. In fact, it's the mission I've been using as B-roll for this coverage. Starlink is the only Earth launch this week, but in order to extend this segment a little bit, I can confirm that on Saturday the 6th of March, Kerbin-based Laun Aerospace will be launching their latest single-stage to orbit space plane, dubbed simply the Hypersonic Crew Transporter. Interesting stuff. Make sure you're subscribed below so that you don't miss that one when I upload the mission on Saturday. Uh, but now it's time to move on to our final segment. All the best historic anniversaries set to take place over the next seven days. Our first historic spaceflight anniversary takes place tomorrow, on March the 2nd, when in 1972 NASA launched the Pioneer 10 space probe atop an Atlas Centaur rocket from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Pioneer 10 was a pioneering mission, <laughs> with the objective to perform the very first mission to the planet Jupiter. On its way to Jupiter, the Pioneer 10 became the first spacecraft to fly beyond the orbit of Mars, and the first to traverse the asteroid belt. Upon arrival at Jupiter on November the 6th, 1973, the spacecraft began taking lots of photographs, around 500 in total, and transmitted them all back to Earth. These photos far exceeded the quality possible from cameras on Earth. I always wonder how amazing it must have been to finally see the planet in such high detail for the first time, when today we take the appearance of our solar system's inhabitants for granted. Pioneer 10 also managed to grab some snaps of the Jovian moons Callisto, Ganymede and Europa, and while the spacecraft could have photographed Io as well, the photopolarimeter had succumbed to radiation by this point, and further photography was not possible. Of the spacecraft's 11 scientific instruments, six of them operated continuously throughout the Jupiter encounter. The Jupiter encounter was declared over on January the 2nd, 1974. The adventure was far from over for Pioneer 10 though. The spacecraft went on to pass Saturn's orbit in February 1976, and then in June 1983 it crossed the orbit of Neptune, the outermost planet, thus becoming the first human-made object to travel beyond the solar system's planets. Routine contact was maintained with the spacecraft for nearly 20 more years, until contact was terminated in March 1997 due to budgetary reasons. Intermittent contact was still made every so often though, until January January 2003, when one last very weak signal was detected from the space probe. 
Unfortunately, the signal was too weak for any usable data to be extracted, and it was clear that the Pioneer 10's RTG power source had decayed and was unable to supply sufficient power to the radio transmitter. One final attempt at contact was made in March 2006, but sadly this failed. However, overall, Pioneer 10 led a very full life. It was originally only designed to last for 21 months, and so the fact it would eventually end up operating for a staggering 30 years means I think it's safe to say we definitely got our money's worth with it. The next anniversary of the week is on March the 3rd, which marks the 1969 launch of Apollo 9. This was, as the name would suggest, part of NASA's Apollo program and was the third crewed mission of the program. The launch was conducted by a Saturn V rocket and the mission tested several things that would be paramount for conducting a successful moon landing. These included testing the lunar module engines, backpack life support systems, navigation systems, and testing docking procedures with the Apollo Command module and the lunar landing module. Docking was performed twice, once while the lunar module was still attached to the Saturn V upper stage, and again once the lunar module was active. The mission splashed down on March the 13th, bringing the total flight time to 241 hours and 53 seconds, and it successfully demonstrated all of the major Apollo spacecraft systems, meeting all prime mission objectives. Lovely stuff. The final anniversary I'm going to discuss this week will take place on March the 5th, when in 1982 the Soviet Union landed the Venera 14 on the surface of Venus. By this point, the Soviets were pretty experienced with Venusian landings, having already launched the Venus landers Venera 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, of which only the Venera 11 failed. Despite touching down successfully, its imaging systems failed. The Venera 14 was identical in design to the Venera 13, which was the first spacecraft to transmit color photographs from the Venusian surface, and the two spacecraft were launched a mere five days apart from one another. The Venera 14 landed about 950 kilometers southwest of its sister and managed to take some photos as well. However, it was also designed to measure the compressibility of the Venusian soil. Now, the cameras on board the spacecraft were protected by lens caps that popped off after descent. By sheer bad luck, these lens caps landed in the exact spot where the probe craned down to measure the soil. Therefore, the mission measured the compressibility of the lens caps rather than the surface of Venus, something I think could have probably been tested far more cheaply here on Earth. Still, a Venus landing is an achievement in and of itself, and the Venera 14 was also the final anniversary I wanted to discuss this week, which therefore brings an end to this video's history segment. <laughs> And that concludes another episode of Space This Week. Wow, guys, I can feel the tension in the air as the SN10 prepares to make its legendary flight, and I can't wait to see what it manages to achieve. Hopefully, provided there are no further anomalies found during pre-flight testing, we'll be able to talk about the outcome of the flight in next week's installment of Space This Week, so make sure that you're definitely subscribed to the channel so that you can catch that video. The SN10 isn't the only flight that I'm hyped up for though. The Martian Ingenuity Helicopter will be taking flight within the next 8 weeks as well. Exciting times we find ourselves in. If you want to watch more Space This Week then there are now two cards on screen. The left will take you to the full Space This Week playlist. The right is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithms. And you can also smash that sub button and check out Patreon as well if you want to. And to make sure you followed me on Twitter as I regularly post updates on there ahead of my Monday Space This Week videos. I've run out of time now, so uh, goodbye.